At this point, I think we have fairly good reason to believe that everything is made of atoms. John Dalton's idea, his theory, that everything is made up of these tiny, indivisible particles that just exchange, that just rearrange when chemical change takes place, matches so much of how the world works that it came to be regarded as a really valuable explanation, a good theory. And we still believe most of it. He was wrong about one thing, though. He said that the particles are indivisible. In other words, there's nothing smaller than an atom. And that turned out not to be true. So to understand a little bit more about what atoms themselves are made of, we're going to look at the work of uh, four people. Um, we're going to focus on, on three of them, J.J. Thompson, Robert Millikan, and then Ernest Rutherford. This first person, J.J. Thompson, he was fooling around with this device called a Crookes tube. Here you see a picture of, of Thompson here. And, and this is his Crookes tube. He's, this is the basic idea behind a Crookes tube. You have this tube. It's a glass tube. It's evacuated. In other words, there's, all the air has been sucked out of it. And then a few atoms of some gas, some pure element, are put inside there. The tube is sealed up so that gas can't get in or out. And then there are two electrical uh, connections, two electrodes. One's called the cathode. It's hooked up to the negative uh, side of a battery. And the other one's called the anode, which is hooked up to the positive side of the battery. And in his tube, there was this little sort of a shadow maker. Here it looks like an iron cross. Here's a picture of the device. And what happens is the end of the tube begins to glow. And you can see when you put this mask on there that uh, that part doesn't glow. So there's this glowing spot on the anode end. People thought that was that was an energy, some kind of energy. But Thompson was able to show, and this shadow kind of indicates that, that it is really a stream of particles is what was happening. And where the particles weren't able to make it to the other end, you'd have this shadow. So he wanted to find out more about these particles. So he set up a thing on the anode end of his apparatus like this. He, he was able to hook up these plates and hook them up to the terminals of the battery. So he could maybe make this positively charged and this negatively charged, or the other way around. And he wanted to see how this stream of particles that was flying through there and impacting the end was going to be affected by these charged plates. What he found was the particles always bent towards the positively charged plate. In other words, if you didn't have any charged plates, or if the plates weren't hooked up, the glowing spot would appear right on the opposite end of the, of the tube from where, they, where it started. But if this was positive up here and this was negative down here, the glowing spot would move up, indicating that the stream of particles had bent upward that way. Reverse it, put the plus down here and the minus up here, and just the reverse would happen. The particles always were moving toward the positively charged plate. Well, Thompson knew that opposites attracted electrically. And so if these things were moving, these little particles were moving towards the positive plate, they must be negatively charged. And his explanation of how this could possibly happen, if the only thing that was in that tube was atoms, and he knew that atoms were neutral, electrically neutral, he thought there must be some little particle in there that must be negatively charged. He named these little particles electrons. This is the name he gave to these little bits of matter that were in atoms, electrons. And he was not able to find what they weighed or how much charge there was. But he found something called the charge to mass ratio. So he could find out that if you took the charge and divided it by the mass, whatever those were, he didn't know either one of them, but he knew the ratio of charge to mass would have to be this, 1.759 times 10 to the 11th coulombs, that's a unit of charge, per kilogram, which is a unit of mass. Uh, this is a big number. 10 to the 11th is like 11 zeros after this number. So he knew that the ratio of charge to mass was really big, but he didn't know what either charge or mass was. So this means they're either very, very small or they have very, very high charge. He knew that atoms were neutral. Whole atoms are neutral. And so he had to come up with a model that explained that. And this is, this is what he proposed. He said that the atom is really this, it's made up of this spherical unit of positively charged kind of mush. That's what most of the atom is like. And then inside there are these little tiny bits that have negative charge, and those are the electrons inside the atom. This came to be called the plum pudding model of the atom because it reminded people, the idea reminded them of a British dessert called the plum pudding that they have at Christmas time. It's sort of like the closest thing we have to it is something like a raisin bran muffin. It's kind of loose, doughy stuff but little bits of raisin inside. That's what people thought of when they, when they saw his model of the atom, so they called it the plum pudding model of the atom. There's another physicist, an American, named Robert Millikan, 
who tried to advance J.J. Thompson's understanding of the electron by doing another experiment. Here's what he did. He sprayed in some oil droplets here from like a little spray bottle, teeny tiny oil droplets, and then he exposed these oil droplets to x-rays. So some energy came in here from x-rays. And what that did was it ionized these droplets. It coated them with a number of electrons. He knew that was going to happen. And that happened inside of this little can. This can had a divider between the top and the bottom, and the divider had a tiny hole in it so that every once in a while a droplet would fall through into this lower part of the can. And these droplets are very small, so he actually had to have a microscope here, and he could look in here with his eye with his microscope and look at one of those droplets. The other feature was this plate was positively charged and the bottom plate was negatively charged. So there was an electrical field in here, and he had a controller on there so he could make that electrical field bigger, or smaller, and what he would do was try and get these particles to be suspended in midair. Here's why that would happen. If you think about this particle, obviously all particles, because of gravity, go downward. And they go downward in proportion to how much they weigh. Physicists all know that mass times g, this number called the acceleration due to gravity, is the force that pulls every particle downward toward the Earth. The other thing that all physicists knew was the charge force was equal to how much charge was on the particle, the drop of oil, times the strength of the electrical field, which is called E. You don't have to worry about the details of this, but know that, that, that it's balanced. QE and MG are equal to each other because this particle ain't moving in. So here's what this means. If Q, the charge on the oil droplet, times E, the strength of the electric field, equals the mass of the droplet times G, he could figure out how much charge was on the particle. Because G, everybody knew, the mass of the oil droplet, he had ways of figuring that out based on how fast it fell. The electrical field, he knew because he was controlling it. The only thing he didn't know was what was the charge on the oil droplet. So if you solve this equation, like Millikan did, you find out that M times G divided by the strength of the electrical field would be the charge on the oil droplet. So he did this. He figured out E, figured out the mass of a whole bunch of droplets, and he figured out what Q was, what the charge was on all these oil droplets. But here's what he knew. The only reason the oil droplet had a charge was because there were a number of electrons stuck to it. And electrons came in whole numbers, he reasoned. And so whatever Q was, Q would have to be some number of electrons. He called that N. Like if there were five electrons stuck to it, that would be five. If there were 11, that would be 11 times the charge on one electron. So by collecting a whole bunch of data and analyzing it, he was able to figure out what's the charge on one electron. Then from there, he took J.J. Thompson's ratio, which remember was a ratio of charge to mass, so a ratio of Q to mass, Q of electron to mass of electron, and J.J. Thompson's number was 1.759 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram. So he knows that ratio. Now he knows the charge on one electron after doing all his calculations. So the charge on one electron divided by the ratio, 1.759 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram, well, that was going to give him the mass of the electron. That just comes from doing algebra on this ratio equation. So his charge turned out to be, the charge he measured, 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, which isn't a very big number. But the ratio was very big, 1.759 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram. So that means the mass of the electron is really tiny. And if you do the math here, here's what it comes up to. 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. That's the mass of an electron. If you could divide the mass of 1,000 raisins into a billion, billion, billion parts, one one thousandth of that is about how much mass we're talking about. It's very small. The next advancement came from this guy here. He was actually a student of J.J. Uh, Thompson's. And he went on to earn a doctor's degree and became a professor himself. And he was studying something called an alpha particle. Here's what they knew about alpha particles. Alpha particles were very heavy compared with electrons. Al alpha particles are much heavier than electrons. And the other thing he knew is they were positively charged. And he wanted to find out how are they going to be affected when they meet individual atoms, what would happen to alpha particles. Here was his experimental setup. He had a piece of gold foil that he hung in the middle. He chose gold foil because he could get it very, very thin. In fact, he could get it just a few hundred atoms thick. 
and then he thought he would have the best his best chance of seeing how individual atoms would be affected. He had a, a a little kind of a gun here that he could shoot alpha particles at the foil, and then he had this movable screen that was on a track, and the screen was made of a material that would spark. It would make a little tiny microscopic spark when any charged particle hit it, like an alpha particle, and this could be moved back and forth when he wanted it to, and then he could see where these alpha particles are going after they went through the gold foil. Here's what he expected to see. He thought gold atoms were plum pudding atoms because that was the current belief at the time. So he thought this gold foil is made up of this array of plum pudding atoms, mostly positively charged mush, and then here's an alpha particle much bigger than any of the electrons in there and positively charged. So he thought it'll go right straight through any alpha particle, go right straight through any atom, and maybe it'll be deflected a little bit if it's attracted toward a negatively charged electron, but mostly they're going to go straight through. So this is what he expected to see. Most of the alpha particles are going to make sparks right on the opposite side of the gold foil. Or maybe even he thought you might see some sparks deflected a little bit. Here's the surprising result that he actually saw. He got particles even bouncing back. He was able to see sparks behind the gold foil. Well, this doesn't match the plum pudding model of the atom very much at all. In fact, he was very surprised to see it. Here's what Rutherford wrote in his journal. It was quite the most incredible event that ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So he was describing this event as if it were a cannonball bouncing off tissue paper. Here's another analogy. Look at this car and this mosquito. Car is moving this way, mosquito is moving this way. The proportion between alpha particle and electron is almost the same as car versus mosquito. What you'd expect is the car hits the mosquito and the mosquito either sticks to the screen or bounces off. Here's what happened. The car bounces off the mosquito. Well, that doesn't happen. And Rutherford knew that couldn't happen, so he had to come up with another way of explaining it. So here's what he said. There has to be something inside the atom, and that something that's inside the atom has to be massive. Compared with electrons, it has to be very big, and it has to be positively charged. Because if it wasn't heavy, alpha particles wouldn't bounce off it, and if it wasn't positively charged, well, it would just, the alpha particles would just stick to it and not bounce off at all. So he comes up with a new model of the atom. Rutherford's model of the atom has this thing that he calls the nucleus. That's his large, positively charged particle inside there. And then the electrons are somewhere on the outside. So there's no longer this spherical space filled with, with positively charged mush. The positive charge, he now believes, is all concentrated inside this relatively heavy thing called the nucleus. And then the little bits that Thompson discovered, the electrons, were scattered around somewhere in the outside. Well, one of Rutherford's students, named Chadwick, went on to discover that the nucleus is actually made out of two smaller parts. His experiment is a little harder to explain, so we're going to kind of gloss over it. But he found out that the nucleus itself was made of protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which just don't have a charge at all. And then the little negatively charged electrons are scattered around on the outside. And this is pretty much the model of the atom that we accept as correct today. Where are the electrons exactly? That's a tougher question and we're going to leave that one alone in this class, but if you take a more advanced chemistry class we'll look in, in greater detail at where the electrons are and you get into some kind of freaky uh, science when you start to realize that you can't ever really know where these electrons are. So if we want to describe the atom. Here are some things that we know about the atom. These details are written down in your notes, and it's not really important that you memorize them, but take note of the sizes. The mass of a proton in grams is about 10 to the negative 24th grams. That's a very small number. These don't weigh very much. The charge on a proton is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. You might recognize that number from Millikan. Neutron, here's the mass in grams, 10 to the 24th. This part of the number, the mantissa, is pretty close to that for the proton, but not exactly. Charge, no charge at all, no coulomb. The other particle, these are called subatomic particles. The other particle is the electron. Electron is 9.109390 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. 10 to the minus 28 grams is 
four orders of magnitude smaller than 10 to the minus 24. In other words, it's about 10,000 times smaller than a proton or a neutron. So they don't weigh very much compared even with protons and neutrons, which are pretty small. The charge is negative 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. Same charge as a proton, except opposite sign. So protons and electrons are opposite but equal in charge. So, so we don't have to write these numbers down, these big complicated numbers over and over again. We have these relative numbers. For a proton, since it's the same as an electron but opposite, we call this plus one. Neutron, zero, doesn't have any charge. And electron, we call minus one, just for shorthand. Those are relative charges. We also have relative masses. Since protons and neutrons weigh about the same, we define the mass of a proton and a neutron in terms of atomic mass units. This isn't a precise definition. This is just an approximation. But a proton weighs approximately one atomic mass unit, or sometimes we call it a U for short. A neutron also weighs approximately one atomic mass unit. But an electron weighs approximately zero atomic mass units because they're so small. The atomic number is a number that defines what element you have. It's the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. This is what gives an element its identity as an element. The periodic table lists this by order of atomic number. If I have a hydrogen atom, let's say, in the middle I have one plus in the proton. That's what the nucleus is. There might be a neutron in there or two. But somewhere out here I've got this one minus that's my electron, and they balance each other. Atomic number is also the number of electrons as long as the atom is neutral, which it turns out isn't usually the case. The mass number is the sum of the numbers of protons plus the number of neutrons in the nucleus of an atom. So you could write it this way. Mass number equals atomic number plus neutrons. N with a little zero is a symbol for neutron. Or we could say number of protons, P with a little plus on is protons, plus neutrons is the mass number. It's easy to see why that would be the case because if protons and neutrons each weigh one atomic mass unit and electrons don't weigh hardly anything, well the number of protons plus the number of neutrons would give you approximately the mass of the atom in atomic mass units. It's called the mass number. There are different kinds of atoms. Atoms aren't all identical like Dalton thought. One thing that is identical if they're all hydrogen atoms, for example, they all have one proton in the nucleus. If they're all oxygens, they all have the same number. If they're all nitrogens, they all have the same number. But they can have different mass numbers. So isotopes are atoms that come from the same element, but they have different mass numbers, which means they must have different numbers of neutrons. Because if they're the same element, they have the same number of protons. So that's what an isotope is. We have a way of describing isotopes so we can tell one from the other. And what we do is we write down the symbol for the element, like X for a generic symbol. And then down here we put the atomic number, like for carbon we'd put 6 because carbon is atomic number 6, or whatever, hydrogen's number 1. And then up here we put, put the mass number so it gives us a complete picture. So here are some examples. Um, let's say we had hydrogen with a mass number of 2. We'd write H, 1, 2, because the atomic number is 1, mass number is 2. Or let's say we had uranium-238. This is kind of a famous isotope. Uranium is element number 92, so we put that down there. That's atomic number. And 238 is the mass number. That's uranium-238, we call that. And here's carbon-14, also kind of famous because of radioactive dating. Some people have heard of carbon-14. Carbon's atomic number 6, mass number for this isotope is 14. So another way of writing this is called hyphen notation. So we'd write this hydrogen 2, we'd write this uranium 238, and we'd write this one carbon 14. It's a little hyphen in between. 